All rise. So our first reading on a session is called to order that the record reflect all parties present when the court last recessed or again present in court. Yes, you may read your statement. Yes, I wrote the statement uh, in confinement, so I'll start now. Uh, following facts are provided in support of the Providence Inquiry for my court martial, United States versus PFC Bradley E. Mann. Personal facts. I am a 25-year-old private first class in the United States Army, currently assigned to headquarters and headquarters company, HHC, U.S. Army Garrison, USAG, <coughs> Joint Base Meyer, Henderson Hall, Fort Meyer, Virginia. Prior to this assignment, I was assigned to HAC, 2nd Brigade <coughs> Combat Team, 10th Mountain Division, at Fort Drum, New York. My primary military occupational specialty, or PMOS, is 35 Foxtrot, Intelligence Analyst. I entered my active duty status on 2 October 2007. I enlisted with the hope of an, obtaining both real world experience and earning benefits under the GI Bill for college opportunities. Facts regarding my position as an Intelligence Analyst. In order to enlist in the Army, I took the I took the standard Armed Services Aptitude Battery, or ASVA. My score on this battery was high enough for me to qualify for any enlisted MOS position. My recruiter informed me that I should select an MOS that complemented my interests outside the military. In response, I told him that I was interested in geopolitical matters and information technology. He suggested I consider becoming an intelligence analyst. After researching the intelligence analyst position, I agreed that this would be a good fit for me. In particular, I enjoy the fact that an analyst could use information derived from a variety of sources to create work products that inform the command of its available choices for determining the best courses of action, or COAs. Although the MOS required working knowledge of computers, it primarily required me to consider how raw information can be combined with other available intelligence sources in order to create products that assisted the command in its situational awareness, or SA. I assessed that my natural interest in geopolitical affairs and my computer skills would make me an excellent intelligence man. After enlisting, I reported to the Fort Meade Military Entrance Processing Station on 1 October 2007. I then traveled to and reported at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri on 2 October 2007 to begin basic combat training, or BCT. Once at Fort Leonard Wood, I quickly realized that I was neither physically nor mentally prepared for the requirements of basic training. My, my BCT experience lasted six months instead of the normal 10 weeks. Uh, due to the medical issues, I was placed in a hold status. A physical examination indicated I sustained injuries to my right shoulder and left foot. Due to those injuries, I was unable to, consider, to continue basic. During medical hold, I was informed that I may be out process from the Army. However, I resisted being chaptered out because I felt I could overcome my medical issues and continue to serve. On 20 January 2008, I was I returned to basic combat training. This time I was better prepared and I completed training on 2 April 2008. I then reported for the MOS specific Advanced Individual Training, or AIT, on 7 April 2008. AIT was, was an enjoyable experience for me. Unlike basic training, where I felt different from the other soldiers, I fit in and did well. I preferred the mental challenges of reviewing a large amount of information from various sources and trying to create useful or actionable products. I especially enjoyed the practice of analysis through the use of computer applications and methods I was familiar with. I graduated from AIT on 16 August 2008 and reported to my first duty station, Fort Drum, New York, on 28 August 2008. As an analyst, significant activities, or SIG acts, were a frequent source of information for me to use in creating work products. I started working extensively with SIG, with SIG apps early after my arrival at Fort Drum. My computer background allowed me to view the tools organic and distributed on the ground system Army, or D6A, computers to create polished work products for the Second Brigade Camp Combat Team Chain of Command. The non commissioned officer in charge, or NCYC, of, this, of the S2 section, Ben Master Sergeant David P. Atkins, uh, recognized my skills and potential and tasked me to work on a tool abandoned by a previously assigned analyst, the Incident Tracker. The Incident Tracker was viewed as a backup to the Combined Information Data Network Exchange, or SIDNI, and as a unit historical reference tool. In the months preceding my upcoming deployment, I worked on creating a new version of the Incident Tracker, and used SIGX to populate it. 
SIGACTs I used were from Afghanistan because at the time our unit was scheduled to deploy to the Logar and Wardak provinces of, of Afghanistan. Later, our unit was reassigned to deploy to eastern Baghdad, Iraq. At that point, I removed the Afghanistan SIGACTs and switched to Iraq SIGACTs. As an analyst, I view the SIGACTs as historical data. I believe this view is shared by other all source analysts as well. SIGACTs give a first look impression of a specific or isolated event. This event can be an improvised explosive device attack, or IED, uh, small arms fire engagement, or, or SAF, SAF, uh, engagement with, host with a hostile force, or any other event a specific unit documented and reported in real time. In my perspective, the information contained within a single SIG act or group of SIG acts is not very sensitive. The events encapsulated within most SIG acts involve either enemy engagements or casualties, most of this information is publicly reported by the Public Affairs Office, or PAO, embedded media pools, or host nation HN media. As I started working with SIGAX, I felt they were similar to a daily journal or log that a person may keep. They capture what happens on a particular day and time. They are created immediately after the event and are, and are potentially updated over a period of hours until a final version is published on the city, uh, on the combined information data network exchange. Each unit has its own standard operating procedure, or SOP, for reporting and reporting SIG acts. The SOP may differ between reporting in a particular deployment and reporting in garrison. In garrison, a SIG act normally involves personnel issues, such as driving under the influence or DUI incidents, or an automobile accident involving the death or serious injury of a soldier. The report starts at the company level and goes up to the battalion, brigade, and even up to the division level. In a deployed environment, a unit may observe or participate in an event, and a platoon leader or platoon sergeant may report the event to a SIGAT as, as a SIGAT to the company headquarters through the radio transmission operator or RTO. Uh, the commander or RTO will then forward the report to the battalion battle captain or battle non-commissioned officer or NCO. Once the battalion battle cap once the battalion battle captain or battle NCO, NCO receives the report, they will either one, notify the battalion operations officer, or S3. Two, conduct an action, such as launching a quick reaction force. Uh, or three, record the event and report and further report about the chain of command to the brigade. The recording of each event is done by radio or over the secret internet protocol router network, or SIPRINET, normally by an assigned soldier, usually junior enlisted, E4 and below. Once the SIG Act is reported, the SIG Act is further sent up the chain of command. At each level, additional information can either be added or corrected as needed. Normally, within 24 to 48 hours, the updating and reporting of a particular SIG act is complete. Eventually, all reports and SIG acts go through the chain of command from brigade to division and division to core. At core level, the SIG act is finalized and published. The city system contains a database that is used by thousands of Department of Defense, DOD personnel, including soldiers, civilians, and contractors at work. It was the United States Central Command, or CENTCOM, reporting tool for operational uh, reporting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Two separate but similar databases were maintained for each theater, Sydney I for Iraq and Sydney A for Afghanistan. Each database can, encompasses over 100 types of reports and other historical information for access. They contain millions of vetted and finalized records, including operational intelligence report. Sydney was created to collect and analyze battle space data to provide daily operational and intelligence community IC uh, reporting relevant to, an, uh, to a commander's daily decision-making process. The Sydney I and Sydney A databases contain reporting and analysis fields for multiple disciplines, including human intelligence or human reports, psychological operations or PSYOP reports, engagement reports, counter-improvised counter explosive device or CIED reports, SIGAC reports, targeting reports, social and cultural reports, civil affairs reports, and human terrain report. As an intelligence analyst, I had unlimited access to the Sydney I and Sydney A databases and the information contained within them. Although each table within the database is important, I primarily dealt with human reports, SIGAC reports, and encounter IED reports because these reports were used to create the work product that was required to publish as an analyst. In working on an assignment, I looked anywhere and everywhere for information. As an all-source analyst, this was something that was expected. 
The D6A systems had databases built in, and I utilized them on a daily basis. This, this includes the search tools available on D6A systems on separate apps, such as Query Tree and the DoD and Interlink search engines. Primarily, I utilize the Sydney database using the historical and human reporting to conduct my analysis and provide a backup for my work product. I did statistical analysis on historical data, including SAS, to back up analyses that were based on human reporting and produce charts, graphs, and tables. I also created maps and, and tape maps and charts to conduct predictive analysis based on statistical trends. The SIGAC reporting provided a reference point for what occurred and provided myself and our analysts with the information to conclude possible outcome. Although SIGAC reporting is sensitive at the time of their creation, their sensitivity normally dissipates within 48 to 72 hours as the information is either publicly re released, the unit, is, the unit involved is no longer in the area and not in danger, or the unit involved is no longer in the area and not in danger. It is my understanding that the SIGAC reports remain classified only because they are maintained within Sydney, because it is, because it is only accessible on Sydney. Everything on Sydney I and Sydney A to include SIGAC reporting is treated as classified information. Facts regarding storage, the storage of SIGAC reports. As part of my training at Fort Drum, I was instructed to ensure that I create backups of my work product. The need to create backups was particularly acute given the relative instability and, and reliability of the computer systems we used in the field during deployment. These computer systems included both organic and field provided equipment, TPE, D6A machines. The organic D6A machines we brought, we brought with us into the field on our deployment were Dell uh, MI laptops, and the TPE D6A machines were Alienware brand laptops. The, M the M90 D6A laptops were the preferred machine to use, as they were slightly faster and had fewer problems with dust and temperature than, than the fewer provided Alienware laptops. I used several D6A machines during the deployment due to, due to various technical problems with the laptops. With these issues, several analysts lost information, but I never lost information due to the multiple backups I created. I intended to back up as much relevant information as possible. I would save the information so that I or another analyst could quickly access it whenever a machine crashed, supernet connectivity was down, or I forgot what data was stored. When backing information, when backing up information, I would do one or all of the following things based on my training. Physical backup. I try to keep physical backup copies of information on paper so that, so that the information could be grabbed quickly. Also, it was easier to brief from hard, copy, hard copies of research and human reports. Two, local, local drive backup. I try to sort out information I deem relevant and keep complete copies of the information on each of the computers I use in the temporary sensitive compartmentalized com, 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 compartmented information facility, or TSCIP including my primary and secondary D6A machines. This was stored under my user profile on the desktop. Share drive or share drive backup. Each analyst had access to a T drive, what we call a T drive, shared across the supernet. It allowed others to access information that was stored on S6 operated the T drive. Com compact disk reliable or CDRW backup. For larger data sets, I would save the information onto a rewritable disk, label the disks, and store them in the conference room of the TSCA. This redundancy permitted us the ability to not worry about information loss. If a system crashed, I could easily pull the information from a secondary computer, the T drive, or one of the CDRWs. If another analyst wanted to access my data, but I was not available, she could find my published products directory on the T drive or on the CDRWs. I sorted all of my products and research by date, time, and group, and updated the information on each of the storage methods to ensure that the latest information was available to them. During the deployment, I had several of D6A machines crash on me. Whenever the computer crashed, I usually lost information, but the redundancy method ensured my ability to quickly restore old backup data and add my current information to the machine when it was repaired or, or replaced. I stored the backup CDRWs of larger data sets in the conference room of the TSCIF or next to my work workstation. I marked the CDRWs based on the classification level and its content. Unclassified CDRWs were only labeled with the content type and not marked with classification markings. Early on in the deployment, I, I only saved and stored the SIGACs that were within or near our operational environment. 
Later, I thought it would be easier just to save all of the city ads onto a CDRW. The process would not take very long to complete, and so I downloaded the city ads from Sydney I onto a, on, onto a, uh, onto a CDRW. After finishing with, the C, with Sydney I, I did the same with Sydney A. By retrieving the Sydney I and Sydney A SIGACs, I was able to retrieve the information whenever I needed it, and not rely upon the unreliable and slow synchronic connectivity needed to pull. Instead, I could just find the CDRW and open the preloaded spreadsheet. This process began in late December 2009 and continued through early January 2010. I could quickly export one month of the SIGAC data at a time and download it in the background as I did other tasks. The process took approximately a week for each table. After downloading the SIGAC tables, I periodically updated them by pulling only the most recent SIGACs and simply copying them and pasting them into the database saved on the TDRW. I never hid the fact that I had downloaded copies of both the SIGAC tables from Sydney I and Sydney A. They were stored on appropriately labeled and marked CDRWs stored in the open. I viewed, I, viewed this, I viewed the same copies of the Sydney I and Sydney A SIGAC tables as being both for my use and the use of anyone within the S2 section during the supernet connectivity issues. In addition to the SIGAC tables, I had a large repository of human reports and speed and counter ID reports downloaded from Sydney I. These contain reports that were relevant to the area in and around our operational environment in Eastern Baghdad and the Dural province of Iraq. In order to compress the data to fit onto a CRW, I used the compression algorithm called BZIT2. The program used to compress the data is called WinRAR. WinRAR is an application that's free and can be easily downloaded from the internet via the non-secure internet relay protocol network or Nipernet. I downloaded WinRAR on Nipernet and transferred it to the D6A machine user profile desktop using a CDRW. I did not try to hide the fact that I was downloading WinRAR onto my SuperNet D6A machine or computer. With the assistance of the EZIT2 compression algorithm using the WinRAR program, I was able to fit all of the SIGACs onto a single CDRW and the relevant human encounter ID reports onto a separate CDRW. That's regarding my knowledge of the WikiLeaks organization, or WLO. I first became vaguely aware of the WLO during my AIT at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Though I did not fully pay attention until WLO until the WLO released purported short messaging system or SMS messages from 11 September 2001 on 25 November 2009. At that time, references to the release and the WLO website showed up in my daily Google News open source search for information related to U.S. foreign policy. The stories were about how WLO published approximately 500,000 messages. I then reviewed the messages myself and realized that the posted messages were very likely real given the sheer volume and detail of the content. After this, I began conducting research on WLO. I conducted searches on both Nipernet and Cipernet on WLO beginning in late November 2009 and early, 2000, uh, early December 2009. At this time, I also began to routinely monitor the WLO website. In response to one of my searches in December 2009, I found the United States Army Counterintelligence Center, or USASIC, report on the WikiLeaks organization. After reviewing the report, I believed that this report was one of the was, was possibly the one that my AIT instructor referenced in early 2008. I may or may not have saved the report on my D6A workstation. I know I reviewed the document on other occasions throughout early 2010 and saved it on both my primary and secondary laptops. After reviewing the report, I continued doing research on WLO. However, based upon my open source collection, I discovered information that contradicted the 2008 USACI report, including information indicating that, similar to other press agencies, WLO seemed to be dedicated to exposing illegal activities and corruption. WLO received numerous awards and recognition for its reporting activities. Also, in reviewing the WLO website, I found information regarding those military SOPs for Camp Delta, at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and information on the then outdated rules of engagement, or ROE, in Iraq for cross border pursuits of former members of Saddam Hussein al Tafriti's government. After seeing the information available on the WLO website, I continued following it and collecting open source information from it. During this time period, I followed several organizations and groups, including wire press agencies such as the Associated Press and Reuters and private intelligence agencies, including strategic forecasting or Stratfor. 
This practice was something I was trained to do during AIT and was something that good animal search experts do. During the, tour, during the searches of WOA, I found several pieces of information that I found useful in my work product that, in my work as an analyst. Specifically, I, I recall WOA publishing documents related to weapons trafficking between two nations that affected my OE. I integrated this information into one or more of my work products. In addition to visiting the WOA website, I became far from WOA using an instant relay chat or IRC client called XCheck sometime in early January 2010. IRC is a protocol for real-time internet communications by messaging or conferencing, colloquially referred to as chat rooms or, or chats. The IRC chat rooms are designed for group communication and discussion forums. Each IRC chat room is called a channel. Similar to a television, you can tune in or follow it, or, or follow a channel, so long as it is open and does not require an invite. Once joined in a specific IRC conversation, other users in the conversation can see that you have joining rooms on the internet, there are millions of different IRC channels across several services. Channel topics span a range of topics covering all kinds of interests and hobbies. The primary reason for following double level on IRC was, curi was curiosity, particularly in regards to how and why they obtained the SMS messages referenced above. I believed, that, I believed that collecting information on the WLO would distance me in, in this goal. Initially, I simply observed the IRC conversations. I wanted to know how the organization was structured and how they obtained their data. The conversations I viewed were usually technical in nature, but sometimes switched to a lively debate on, on issues a particular individual may have felt strongly about. Over a period of time, I became more involved in these discussions, especially when conversations turned to geopolitical events and information, topic, information technology topics, such as networking and encryption methods. Based on these observations, I would describe the WLO organization as almost academic in nature. In addition to the WLO conversations, I participated in numerous other IRC channels across at least three different networks. The other IRC channels I participated in normally dealt with technical topics, including the Linux and Berkeley uh, security distribution, BSD operating systems or OSs, networking, encryption algorithms and techniques, and other more political topics, such as politics and queer rights. I normally engage in multiple IRC conversations simultaneously, mostly publicly but often privately. The XChat client enabled me to manage these multiple conversations across different channels and servers. The screen for XChat was often busy, but experience enabled me to see when something was interesting. I would then select the conversation and either observe or participate. I really enjoyed the IRC conversations pertaining to and involving the WLO. However, at some point in late February or early March, of 2010, the WLO IRC channel was no longer accessible. Instead, regular participants of this channel switched to using a Jabber server. Jabber is another internet communication tool similar but more sophisticated than IRC. The IRC and Jabber conversations allowed me to feel connected to others even more. They helped me and helped me pass the time and keep more data throughout the deployment. Facts regarding the unauthorized storage and disclosure of the SIGATs. As indicated above, I created copies of the Sydney I and Sydney A SIGAC tables as part of the process of backing up information. At the time I did so, I did not intend to use this information for any purpose other than for backup. However, I, I later decided to release this information publicly. At that time, I believe and still believe that these tables are two of the most significant documents of our time. On 8 January 2010, I collected the CDRW I stored in the conference room of the T-Skip and placed it into the cargo pocket of my ACU, or Army Combat Uniform. At the end of my shift, I took the CDRW out of the T-Skip and brought it to my containerized housing or CHU. I copied the data onto my personal laptop. Later, at the beginning of my shift, I returned, to, I returned the CDRW back to the conference room of the T-Skip. At the time, I saved the SIGGAS to my laptop. I planned to take them I plan to take them with me on mentor leave and decide what to do with them. At some point prior to my mentor leave, I transferred the information from my computer to a secure digital memory card for my digital camera. The SD card for the camera also worked on my computer and allowed me to, allowed me to store the CVAC tables in a secure manner for transport. I began mentor leave on 23 January 2010, flying from Atlanta, Georgia to Reagan National Airport in Virginia. I arrived at the home of my aunt 
that for Amazon Alstom and Potomac Mural and quickly got into contact with my then boyfriend Tyler R. Watkins. Tyler, then a student at Brandeis University in Walton, Massachusetts, and I made plans to, for me to visit him in Boston, Massachusetts area. I was excited to see Tyler and plans to, on talking to Tyler about where our relationship was going and about my time around. However, when I arrived in the Boston area, Tyler and I seemed to become distant. He did not seem very excited about my return from Iraq. I tried talking to him about our relationship, but he refused to make any plans. I also tried raising the topic of releasing the Sydney I and Sydney A cigarette tables to the public. I asked Tyler hypothetical questions about what he would do if he had documents that he thought the public needed that the public needed access to. Tyler didn't really have a specific answer for me. He tried to answer the question and be supportive, but seemed confused by the question by the question and its context. I then tried to be more specific, but he asked too many questions. Rather than try to explain my dilemma, I, des I, I decided just to drop the conversation. After a few days in Waltham, I began feeling that I was overstaying my welcome, and I returned to Maryland. I spent the remainder of my time on leave in the Washington, D.C. area. During this time, a blizzard bombarded the Mid-Atlantic, and I spent a significant period of time essentially stuck at my aunt's house in Maryland. I began to think about what I knew and the information I still had in my possession. For me, the SIGACs represented the on the ground reality of both the conflicts of both the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. I felt we were risking so much for we were risking so much for people that seemed unwilling to cooperate with us, leading to frustration and hatred on both sides. I began to become depressed with the situation that we found ourselves increasingly mired in, year after year. The CNAX documented this in great detail, and provided context to what we were seeing on the ground. In attempting to conduct counterterrorism, C or CT, and counterinsurgency coin operations, we became obsessed with capturing and killing human targets on lists, and on being suspicious of and avoiding co cooperation with our host nation partners, and ignoring the second and third order effects of accomplishing short-term goals and missions. I believe that if the general public, especially the American public, had access to the information contained within the Sydney and I and Sydney A tables, this could spark a domestic debate on the role of the military and our foreign policy in general, as well as related to Iraq and Afghanistan. I also believe the detailed analysis of the, of the data over a long period of time by different sectors of society might cause society to reevaluate the need or even the desire to engage in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations that ignore the debate that ignore the complex dynamics of the people living in the affected environment every day. At, at my aunt's house, I debated what I should do with the SIGACs. In particular, whether I should hold on to them or disclose them to a press agency. At this point, I decided it made sense to try and disclose the SIGAC tables to an American newspaper. I first called my local newspaper, the Washington Post, and spoke with a woman saying that she was a reporter. I asked her if the Washington Post would be interested in receiving information that would have enormous value to the American public. Although we spoke for about five minutes concerning the general nature of, of what I possess, I do not believe she took me seriously. She informed me that the Washington Post would possibly be interested, but that such decisions are made only after seeing the information I was referring to and after consideration by the senior editors. I then decided to contact the largest and most popular newspaper, the New York Times. I called the public editor number on the New York Times website. The phone rang and was answered by a machine. I went through the menu to the section for news tips and was routed to an answer machine. I left a message stating I had access to information about Iraq and Afghanistan that I believed was very important. However, despite leaving my Skype phone number and personal email address, I never received a reply from the New York Times. I also briefly considered dropping into the office for the political commentary blog Politico. However, the weather conditions during my leave hampered my efforts in travel. After these failed efforts, I ultimately decided to submit the materials to the WLO. I was not sure if the WLO would actually publish the SIGAC tables or, or, even if they would pub or even if they would publish. I was concerned that they might, that they might, I was also concerned that they might not be noticed by the American media. However, based upon what I read about the WLO, through my research described above, this seemed to be the best medium for publishing this information to the world within my reach. At my aunt's house, I joined in on an IRC conversation and stated I had information that needed to be shared with the world. I wrote that the information would help document the true costs of the war and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of the individuals in the IRC 
asked me to describe the information. However, before I can describe the information, another individual pointed me to the link for the AWO website's online submission system. After ending my IRC connection, I considered my options one more time. Ultimately, I felt that the right thing to do was to release the sale. On 3 February 2010, I visited the WLO website on my computer and clicked on the Submit Documents link. Next, I found the Submit Your Information Online link and elected to submit the SIGAX via the, uh, via the Onion Router, or TOR, T-O-R, an anonymizing network by a special link. TOR is a system intended to provide anonymity online. The software routes internet traffic through a network of servers and other Tor clients in order to conceal a user's location and identity. I was familiar with Tor and had it previously installed on a computer to anonymously monitor the social media websites of militia groups operating within central Iraq. I followed the prompts and attached the, the compressed data files of Sydney I and Sydney A SIGX. I attached a text file I drafted while preparing to provide the documents to the Washington Post. They provided rough guidelines saying, it's already been digitized in any source identifying information. You might need to sit on this information perhaps 90 to 100 days, to figure out how best to release such a large amount of data and, for, and to protect the source. This is possibly one of the more significant documents of our time, removing the fog of war and revealing the true nature of 21st century asymmetric warfare. Have a good day. After sending this, I left the SD card in a camera case at my aunt's house in the event I needed it again in the future. I returned from mutual leave on 11 February 2010. All of the information had not yet been publicly... had not yet been published by the WLO. I felt a sense of relief by them having it. I felt I had accomplished something that allowed me to, to have a clear conscience based upon what I had seen, read, and read, read about, and knew that were happening in both Iraq and Afghanistan every day. Facts regarding the unauthorized storage and disclosure of 10 Reykjavik 13. I first became aware of the diplomatic cables during my training period in the IT. I later learned about the Department of State, or DRS, Net Central Diplomacy, NCD, formal from the 210 Brigade Combat Team, uh, S2, Captain Stephen Lim. Captain Lim sent a section-wide email to the other analysts and officers in late December 2009, containing the cybernet link to the portal, along with the instructions to look at the cables contained within them and to incorporate them into our work product. Shortly after this, I also noticed that diplomatic cables were being referred to in products from the core level of uh, U.S. Forces Iraq, or USFI. Based upon Captain Lynn's direction to become familiar with its contents, I read virtually every published cable concerning Iraq. I also began scanning the database and, other, uh, and reading other random cables that piqued my curiosity. It was around this time, in early to mid-January 2010, that I began searching the database for information on ISIS. I became interested in Iceland due to the IRC conversations I viewed in the WLO channel, discussing an issue called Ice Save. At this time, I was not very familiar with the topic, but it seemed to be a big issue for those participating in the conversation. This is when I decided to investigate and conduct a few searches on Iceland and find more. At the time, I did not find anything. I did not find anything discussing the Ice Save issue, either directly or indirectly. I then conducted an open source search for Ice Save. I then. I then learned that Iceland was involved in a dispute with the United Kingdom and the Netherlands concerning the financial collapse of one or more of Iceland's banks. According to open source reporting, much of the public controversy involved the, the United Kingdom's use of anti-terrorism legislation against Iceland in order to freeze Icelandic assets for payment of the guarantees for UK depositors that lost money. Shortly after returning from mid leave, I returned to the Netcentric Diplomacy portal to search for information on Iceland and ISAVE as the topic had not abated on the WLO IRC channel. To my surprise, on 14 February 2010, I found the cable 10 Rank 13, which referenced the ISAVE issue directly. The cable, published on 13 January 2010, was just over two pages in length. I read the cable and quickly concluded that Iceland was essentially being bullied diplomatically by two larger European powers. It appeared to me that Iceland was out of viable was out of viable options and was coming to the U.S. for assistance. Despite their quiet request for assistance, it did not appear we were going to do anything. From my perspective, it appeared we were not getting involved due to the lack of long-term geopolitical benefit to do so. After digesting the contents of 10 Break to Big 13, I debated on whether this was something I should send to the WLO. 
At this point, the WO had not published nor acknowledged receipt of the Sydney I and Sydney A SIG Act cables. Despite not knowing that the SIG Acts were priorities for the WO, I decided the cable was something that would be important, and I felt I might be able to write along by having them publish this document. I burned the document, or I burned the information onto a CDRW on 15 February 2010, took it to my tube, and saved it out to my personal laptop. I navigated to the WLO website via a Tor connection, like before, and uploaded the document via the secure form. Amazingly, the WLO published 10 by 13 within hours, proving that the form worked and that they must have received the CIF tape. Okay. Facts regarding the unauthorized disclosure, unauthorized storage and disclosure of the, of the 12 July 2007 Air Weapons Team or AWT video. During the mid tour or during the mid February 2010 timeframe, Second Brigade Combat Team, 10th Mountain Division, targeting analyst, then specialist Joya W. Schoen, and others discussed a video that Ms. Sherman had found on the T track. The video de depicted several individuals being engaged by, by an aerial weapons team. At first, I did not consider the video very special, as I had viewed countless other war, -tor, war, war porn type videos depicting combat. However, the recorded audio comments by the by the aerial weapons team crew and the second engagement in the video of an unarmed bongo truck troubled me. It's shown that a few other analysts and officers in the T-Skit commented on the video and debated whether the crew violated the rules of engagement, or RG, in the second engagement. I shied away from this debate and instead conducted some research on the event. I wanted to learn what happened and whether there was any background to the events of the day that the event occurred, 12 July 2007. Using Google, I searched for the event by its date and general location. I found several news accounts involving two Reuters employees who were killed during the Air Rocket Team's engagement. Another story explained that Reuters had requested for a video of video, uh, requested for a copy of the video under the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA. Reuters wanted to, wanted to view the video in order to be able to understand what had happened and to improve their safety practices in combat zones. A spokesperson for Reuters was quoted as saying that the video might help avoid the reoccurrence of the tragedy and believe there was a compelling need for the immediate release of the video. Despite the submission of the FOIA request, the new account explained that CENTCOM replied to Reuters stating that they could not give a time frame for considering the FOIA request and that the video no longer, might no longer exist. Another story I found, written a year later, said that even though Reuters was still pursuing the request, they still did not receive a formal response or written determination in accordance with what. The fact that neither CENTCOM nor uh, Multinational Forces of Iraq or MCF, MNFI would not voluntarily release the video troubled me further. It was clear to me that the event happened because the Aero Weapons Team mistakenly identified various employees as a potential threat and that the people in the Bongo truck were merely attempting to assist the wounded. The people in the van were not a threat, but merely good, good Samaritans. The most alarming aspect of the video to me, however, was the seemingly delightful bloodlust the air weapons they, had, they appeared to have. They dehumanized the individuals they were engaging and seemed to not value human life by referring to them as, quote, dead bastards, unquote, and, for, and congratulating each other on the ability to kill in, a lar in large numbers. At one point in the video, there's an individual on the ground attempting to crawl to safety. The individual is, is seriously wounded. Instead of calling for medical attention to the location, one of the aerial weapons team crew members verbally asked for a wounded person to pick up a weapon so that he can have a reason to engage. For me, this seems similar to a child torturing hands with a magnifying glass. While saddened by the aerial weapons team's crew, of the aerial weapons team's crew lack, uh, crew's lack of concern about human life, I was disturbed by the response to the discovery of injured children at the scene. In the video, you can see the bongo truck driving up to, ass to assist the wounded individual. In response, the air weapon team, the air weapons team crew, as soon as the individuals are struck, they repeatedly request for authorization to fire on the bongo truck, and once granted, and once granted they engage the vehicle at least six times. Shortly after the second engagement, a mechanized infantry unit arrives at the scene. Within minutes, the air weapons team 
crew learns that children that children are in the van, and despite the injuries, the, the crew, crew exhibits no remorse. Instead, they downplay the significance of their actions, saying, quote, well, it's their fault for bringing their kids into a battle, unquote. The Air Weapons Team crew members sound like they, they lack sympathy for the children or the parents. Later, in a particularly disturbing manner, the Air Weapons Team crew verbalizes enjoyment at the sight of one of the ground vehicles driving over a body, or one of the bodies. As I continued my research, I found an article discussing a book, The Good Soldiers, written by Washington Post writer David Fink. In Mr. Finkel's book, he writes about the Air Weapons Team attack. As I read an online excerpt, on Google Books, I followed Mr. Finkel's account of the event along with the video. I quickly realized that Mr. Finkel was quoting, I feel in verbatim, the audio communications of the Area Weapons Team crew. It's clear to me that Mr. Finkel obtained access and a copy of the video during his tenure as an embedded journalist. I was aghast at Mr. Finkel's portrayal of the incident. Reading his account, one would believe the engagement, the engagement was somehow justified as payback for an earlier attack that led to the death of a soldier. Mr. Finkel, Mr. Finkel ends his account of the engagement by discussing how a soldier finds an individual still alive from the attack. He writes that the soldier finds him and sees him gesture with his two forefingers together, a common method in the Middle East to communicate that they are friendly. However, instead of assisting him, the soldier makes an obscene gesture, extending his middle finger. The individual apparently dies shortly thereafter. Reading this, I can only think of how this person was simply trying to help others, and then quickly finds he needs help as well. <laughs> to make matters worse, in the last moments of his life, he continues to express his friendly gest his, his friendly intent, only to find himself receiving this well-known gesture of unfriendliness. For me, it's all a big mess, and I'm left wondering what these things mean and how it all fits together, and it burdens me emotionally. I saved a copy of the video on my workstation. I searched for and found the rules of engagement, uh, the rules of engagement annexes, and a flowchart from the 2007 time period, as well as an unclassified rules of engagement smart card from 2006. On 15 February 2010, I burned these documents onto the CPRW, the same time, the same time I burned the 10 Reykjavik 13 cable onto the CPRW. At, at the time, I placed the video and rules of engagement information onto my personal laptop in my tube. I plan to keep this information there until I redeploy it in the summer of 2010. I plan on providing this to the writer's office in London to assist them in preventing the events such as this in the future. However, after the, the WLO published 10 Reykjavik 13, I altered my plans. I decided to provide a video and rules of engagement to them so that the so that writers would have this information before I redeploy from Iraq. On, on about 21 February 2010, as described above, I used the WLO submission form and uploaded the documents. The WLO released the video on 5 April 2010. After the release, I was concerned about the impact of the video and how it would be perceived by the general public. I hoped that the video would be, I, I hoped that the public would be as long, alarmed as me about the conduct of the air weapon, of the air weapons team crew members. I wanted the American public to know that not everyone in Iraq and Afghanistan were targets that needed to be neutralized, and rather people who were struggling to live in the pressure cooker environment of what we call asymmetric warfare. After the release, I was encouraged by a response in the media and general public who observed the Aero Weapons Team video. As I hoped, others were just as troubled, if not more troubled, than, I, than, than me by what they saw. Uh, at this time, I began seeing reports claiming that the Department of Defense and CENTCOM could not confirm, could not confirm the authenticity of the video. Additionally, one of my supervisors, Captain Casey Holden, stated her belief that the video was not authentic. In her response, I decided to ensure that the authenticity of the video would not be questioned in the future. On 25 February 2010, I emailed Captain Holden a link to the video that was on our team drive and a copy of the video published by Red Yolo from that was collected by the Open Source Center so she could, so she could compare them herself. Around this time frame, I wrote a second CDRW containing the air, air weapons team video. In order to make it appear authentic, I placed a classification sticker and wrote Reuters FOIA REQ on its face. I placed the CDRW in one of my personal CD cases containing a set of starting out in Arabic CDs. I planned on mailing the CDRW 
two writers after I redeployed so that they could have a copy that was unquestionably authentic. Almost immediately after submitting the, the Aerial Weapons Team video and the Rules of Engagement documents, I notified the individuals in the WLO IRC to expect uh, an important submission. I received a response from an individual going by the handle of Ox. At first, our conversations were general in nature, but over time, as our conversations progressed, I assessed this individual to be an important part of the WLO. Due to the strict adherence of anonymity by the WLO, we never exchanged identifying in information. However, I believe the individual is likely Mr. Julian Asangi, Mr. Daniel Schmidt, or a proxy representative of Mr. Asangi and Schmidt. As the communications transferred from IRC to the uh, Java client, I gave the office and later press association the name of Nathaniel Frank in my address book. After the author of after the author of a book I read in 2009. After a period of time, I developed what I felt was a friendly relationship with Nathaniel. Our mutual interest in information technology and policies made our conversations enjoyable. We engaged in the conversation often. Sometimes as long as an hour or more. I often look forward to my conversation with Nathaniel after work. The anonymity that was provided by Tor, the Java client, and the WLO's policy allowed me to feel I could just make myself free of the concerns of social label labeling and perceptions that are often placed upon me in real life. In real life, I lacked a close friendship with the people I worked with in my section, the S2 section. In my section, the S2 section is subordinate battalions and Second Brigade Combat Team as a whole. For instance, I lacked close ties with my roommate due to his discomfort regarding my perceived sexual orientation. Over the next few months, I stayed in frequent contact with Nathaniel. We conversed on nearly a daily basis, and I felt that we were developing a friendship. The conversations covered many topics, and I enjoyed the ability to talk about pretty much anything, and not just the publications that the WLO was working on. In retrospect, I realized that these dynamics were artificial, and were valued more by myself than Nathaniel. For me, these conversations represent an opportunity to escape from the immense pressures and anxiety that I experienced and built up throughout the deployment. It seemed that, I would try, that as I tried harder to fit in at work, the more I seemed to alienate my peers, lose respect, trust, and the support I needed. Facts regarding the unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized storage and disclosure of documents related to the detainees by the Iraqi Federal Police, or FP, the and the detainee assessment briefs, and the USASIC, uh, United States Army Counterintelligence Center report. On 27 February 2010, a report was, a report was received from a subordinate battalion. The report described an event in which the Federal Police obtained, or FP, detained 15 individuals for printing anti-Iraqi anti literature. By 2 March, 2010, I received instructions from an S3 section officer in the in the Second Brigade Combat Team at Mountain Division Tactical Operations Center or TOC to investigate the matter and figure out who these quote bad guys unquote were and how significant this event was for the federal police. Over the course of my research, I found that none of the individuals had previous ties with anti-Iraqi actions or suspected terrorist or militia groups. A few hours later, I received several photos from the scene from the subordinate battalion. They were, they, were, they were accidentally sent to an officer on a different team in the S2 section, and she forwarded them to me. These photos included pictures of the individuals, pallets of unprinted paper, and seamed copies of the final printed material, or printed document, and a high resolution photo of the printed material itself. I printed a blown up copy of the high resolution photo, and laminated it for ease of use and transport. I then walked to the top and delivered the laminated copy to our Category 2 interpreter. She reviewed the information and about a half an hour later delivered a rough written transcript in English to the S2 section. I read the transcript and followed up with her, asking her for her take on, on the contents. She said it was easy for her to transcribe through Barry since, uh, since I wrote the photograph and laminated it. She said the general nature of the document was benign. The documentation, as I assessed as well, was merely a scholarly critique of the event current Iraqi Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki. It detailed corruption within the, within the cabinet of al-Maliki's government and the financial impact of this corruption on the Iraqi people. 
After discovering this discrepancy between the federal police's report and the interpreter's tra transcript, I forwarded this, this, this discovery to the Talk OIC and Battle of NCOIC. In Talk OIC, and the overhearing battle captain uh, informed me that they didn't want or that they didn't need or want to know this information anymore. They told me to, quote, drop it, unquote, and to just assist them and, and the federal police in finding out where more of these print shop screening, quote, anti Iraqi literature, unquote, might be. I couldn't believe what I heard, or I couldn't believe what I heard, and I returned to the T skip and complained to more analysts in my section in CYC about what happened. Some were sympathetic, but no one wanted to do anything about it. I am the type of person who likes to know how things work, and as an analyst, this means I always want to figure out the truth. Unlike other analysts in my section or other sections within the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, I was not satisfied with just scratching the surface and producing canned or cookie-cutter assessments. I wanted to know why something was the way it was and what we could do to correct or mitigate a situation. I knew that if I continued to assist Baghdad Federal Police in identifying the political opponents of Prime Minister al-Maliki, those people would be arrested and in the custody of, and in the custody of the special unit of the Baghdad Federal Police, very likely tortured and not seen again for a very long time, if ever. Instead of assisting the special unit of the Baghdad Federal Police, I decided to take the information and dispose it to the WRO in the hope that, before the upcoming 7 March 2010 election, they could generate some immediate press on the issue and prevent the unit of the Federal Police from continuing to crack down on political opponents of al -Mali. On 4 March 2010, I burned the report, the photos, the high-resolution high copy of the pamphlet, and the interpreter's handwritten transcript onto a CDRW. I took the CDRW to my shoe and copied the data onto my personal computer. Unlike the times before, instead of uploading the information through the WRO website's submission form, I made a secure file transfer protocol or SFTP connection to a cloud Dropbox operated by the WLO. The Dropbox contained a folder that allowed me to upload directly into it. Saving files into this directory allowed me allowed anyone with login access to the server to view and download them. After downloading these files, after uploading these files to the WLO on 5 March 2010, I notified Nathaniel over, over Jabber. Although sympathetic, he said that the WLO needed more information to confirm the event in order for it to be published or to gain interest in the international media. I attempted to provide these specifics, but to my disappointment, the WLO website chose not to publish this information. At the same time, I began sifting through information from the U.S. SOUTHCOM, or U.S. Southern Command, or U or SOUTHCOM, and Joint Task Force Guantanamo Cuba, or JTF, GTMO. The thought occurred to me, although unlikely, that I wouldn't be surprised if the, although unlikely, that I wouldn't be surprised if the individuals detained by the federal police might be turned over back into U.S. custody and end up in the custody of Joint Task Force Guantanamo. As I did, as I did, as I digested, as I digested through the information on Joint Task Force Guantanamo, I quickly found the detainee assessment briefs or DAPs. I previously came across these documents before, in 2009, but did not, but did not think much of them. However, this time I was more curious during this search, and I found them again. The, the DAPs were written in standard DOD. Or, uh, memorandum format and addressed the commander, U.S. Southcom. Each memorandum gave basic and background information about a specific detainee held at some point by a Joint Task Force Guantanamo. I had always been interested on the issue of the moral efficacy of our actions surrounding Joint Task Force Guantanamo. On the one hand, I've always understood the need to detain and interrogate individuals who might wish to harm the United States and our allies. However, I felt that that, that that was, however, I felt that's what we were doing, what we were trying to do at Joint Task Force Guantanamo. However, the more I became educated on the topic, it seemed that we found ourselves holding an increasing number of individuals indefinitely that we believed or knew to be innocent, low-level foot, low foot soldiers that, we didn't, that did not have useful intelligence and would be released if they were still in theater, if they were still held in theater. I also recall that in early 2009, the then newly elected president, Barack Obama stated that he would close Joint Task Force Guantanamo and that, and that the facility compromised our standing of the world and diminished our 
Both more well for the I put. After familiarizing myself with the detained assessment briefs, I agree. Reading through the detained assessment briefs, I noticed that they were not analytical products. Instead, they contained summaries of Caroline Version's interim intelligence reports that were older, unclassified. None of the data contained names of sources or quotes from the tactical interrogation reports or TIRs. Since the, since the data were being sent to the U.S. Southcom commander, I assessed that they were intended to provide very general background information on each detainee and not a detailed assessment. In addition to the manner that the data were written, I recognized that they were at least several years old and discussed, and discussed detainees that were already released from Joint Task Force Guantanamo. Based on this, I determined that the data were not very important from either an intelligence or national security standpoint. On 7 March, 2010, during my job conversations with Nathaniel, I asked him if he thought the DAVs were of any use to anyone. Nathaniel indicated, although he didn't, did not believe that they were of political significance, he did not believe, uh, he, did, he did believe that they could be used to merge into the general historical account of what occurred at Joint Task Force Guantanamo. He also thought that the, da that the DAVs might be helpful to the legal counsel of those currently in previously held at JTF, GTMO. After this discussion, I decided to demo the DAVs. I had used an application called WGET to download the DAVs. I downloaded WGET off of the Nipronet laptop in the TCF like other programs. I saved that onto a CDRW and placed the executable in my My Documents directory of my user profile up on the D6A Cypernet workstation. On 7 March 2010, I took the list of four link, uh, I took the list, I took a list of links for the uh, detainee assessment briefs and then we get downloaded them sequentially. I burned the data onto a CDRW and took it into my CHU and copied them to my personal computer. On 8 March 2010, I combined the detainee assessment briefs with the United States Army Counterintelligence Center report on the on the on the WLO into a compressed zip file or zip file. Zip files contain multiple files which are compressed to reduce their size. After creating the zip file, I uploaded the file onto their cloud Dropbox via secure file tra transfer protocol. Once these were uploaded, I notified Nathaniel that the information was in the X directory, which had been designated for my use. Earlier that day, I downloaded the USASIC report on WLO. As, as discussed above, I previously reviewed the report on numerous occasions and Although I saved the document onto the workstation before, I could not locate it. After I found the document again, I downloaded it to my workstation and saved it onto the same CDRW as the detainee assessment brief, briefs described above. Although my access included a great deal of information, I decided I had nothing else to send to WLO after sending the detainee assessment briefs and the USAID's report. Up to this point, I had sent them the following. The Sydney I and Sydney A SIGAC tables, the Regiment 13 Department of State Cable, the 12 July 2007 Aerial Weapons Team video, and the 2006-2007 uh, Rules of Engagement documents. The SIGAC report and supporting documents concerning the 15 individuals detained by the Baghdad Federal Police, the U.S. Southcom and Joint Task Force Guantanamo detained assessment groups, the USAID report on the WikiLeaks website, on the WikiLeaks organization and website. Over the next over the next few weeks, I did not find or I did not send any additional information to the WLO. I considered, uh, I continued to converse with Nathaniel over the Java client and in the WLO IRC channel. But although I stopped sending documents to WLO, no one associated with the WLO pressured me into giving more information. The decision that I made to send documents and information to the WLO and website for my own decisions and take full responsibility for my actions. Facts regarding the unauthorized words and disclosure of other government documents. On 22 March 2010, I downloaded two documents. I found these documents over the course of my normal duties as an analyst. Based on my, my, my training and the possible guidance of my superior and the guidance of my superiors, I looked at as much information as possible. Doing so provided me with the ability to make connections others might miss. On several occasions during the month of March, I accessed information from a government entity. I read several documents from a section within this government entity. The content of, of two of these documents upset me greatly. I had difficulty believing what the section was doing. On 22 March 2010, 
I downloaded the two documents that I found troubling. I compressed them into a zip file named blog.zip and burned them onto a CDRW. I took the CDRW to my CHU and saved the file to my personal computer. I uploaded the information to the WLA website using the designated prompt. Facts regarding the unauthorized storage and disclosure of the net center of the policy of the Department of State Papers. In late March of 2010, I received a warning over chat from Nathaniel that the WLO website would be publishing the Area Weapons Team video. He indicated that the WLO would, very like, would, very, would be very busy and the frequency and, and intensity of our Java conversations decreased significantly. During this time, I had nothing but work to distract me. I read a more of the diplomatic cables published on the Department of State Net Central Diplomacy server. With my stationary curiosity and, in, and interest in geopolitics, I became fascinated with them. I read not only the cables on Iraq, but also about countries and events I found interesting. The more I read, the more I was fascinated by the way we dealt with other nations and organizations. I also began to think they documented backdoor deals and seemingly criminal activity that didn't seem characteristic of the de facto leader of the free world. Up to this point during the deployment, I had issues I struggled with and difficulty at work. Of the documents released, the cables were the only one I was not absolutely certain it couldn't harm the United States. I conducted research on the cables published on the net on on that center of diplomacy, as well as how the Department of State say cables work in general. In particular, I wanted to know how each cable was published on SimperNet via the net center of diplomacy. As part of my open source research, research, I found a document published by the Department of State on its official website. The document provided guidance on cache markings for individual cables and handling instructions for their distribution. I quickly learned that the caption markings clearly detail the sensitivity level of the Department of State cable. For example, no disk or no distribution was used for messages of the highest sensitivity and were only distributed to the authorized recipients. The SIP disk or SIPRNET distribution caption was applied only to reporting and other information messages that were deemed appropriate for a release of, of a wide number of, to a wide number of individuals. According to the Department of State guidance for cable to have the SIP disk that caption, it could not include other captions that were intended to limit distribution. The SIP disk caption was, was only for information that could be shared with anyone with access to SIPRNET. I, I was aware that thousands of military personnel, DOD, or Department of State, and other civilian agencies have easy access to the tables. And the fact that the SIP disk caption was, was only for wide distribution made sense to me given the given that the vast majority of the message of diplomacy cables were not classified. The more I read the cables, the more I, I came to the conclusion that this was the type of information that should be, uh, that this type of information should become public. I once read and used a quote uh, on open diplomacy written after the First World War, and how the world would be a better place if states would avoid making secret pacts and deals with, with and against each other. I thought these cables were a prime example of the need for a more open diplomacy. Given all the Department of State information I read, the fact that most of the cables were unclassified and that all, all the cables had the SIP disk caption, I believe that the public release of these cables would not, damage, would, would not damage the United States. However, I do believe that the cables might be embarrassing, since they represent very honest opinions and, and assessments or statements behind the backs of other nations and organizations. In many ways, these cables are a catalog of clicks and gossip. I believe exposing this information might make, might make some within the Department of State and other government entities unhappy. On 22, uh, on 22 March 2010, I began downloading a copy of, of SIP disk cables using, uh, using the program WGET described above. I used instances of the WGET application to download the Net Central Diplomacy cables in the background. As I worked on my daily tasks, and that's the trick the flimsy cables were downloaded from, 20, uh, from 28 March 2010 to 9 April 2010. After downloading the cables, I saved them onto a CDRW. These cables went from the earliest dates on, in that centric diplomacy to 28 February 2010. I took the CDRW to my shoe on 10 April 2010. I sorted the cables on my personal computer compressed them using the visa tube compression algorithm described above and uploaded them to the WLO via the designated drop box described above. 
On 3 May 2010, I used Dadgum Get to download an update of the cables for the for the months of 20 or for the months of March 2010 and April 2010, and saved the information onto a zip file and burned it to a CDRW. I took I then took the inform, or then took the CDRW to my shoe and saved it to my computer. I later found that the file was corrupted during the transfer. Although I intended to resave another copy of these cables, I was removed from the TCF on 8 May 2010 after an altercation. Facts regarding the unauthorized storage and disclosure of the Guarani Farah province, Afghanistan, 15 6 investigation and videos. In late March 2010, I discovered a U.S. CENTCOM directory on a 2009 airstrike in Afghanistan. I was searching CENTCOM for information I could use as an analyst. As described above, this was something that myself and other analysts and officers did on a frequent basis. As I reviewed the, the documents, I recalled the incident and what happened. The airstrike occurred in a Garani village in the Farah province in northwestern Afghanistan. It received worldwide press and co worldwide press coverage during the time as it was reported that up to 100 to 150 Afghan civilians, mostly women and children, were accidentally killed during the airstrike. After going through the report and saying that, Annexes, I began to review the incident as being similar to the 12 July 2007 area weapons team engagements in Iraq. However, this event was noticeably different in that it involved a significantly higher number of individuals, larger aircraft, and much heavier munitions. Also, the conclusions of the report are even more disturbing than those of the 12 July 2007 incident. I did not see anything in the 15-6 report or its annexes that gave away sensitive information. Rather, the investigation and its conclusions help explain how this incident occurred and what those uh, and what those involved should have done and how to avoid an event like this from occurring again. After investigating the report and its annexes, I downloaded the 15-6 investigation, PowerPoint presentations, and several other supporting documents to my DCSA workstation. I also downloaded three zip files containing the videos of the incident. I burned this information onto a CDRW and transferred it to the, pers uh, to the personal computer in my chair. Either later that day or the next day, I uploaded the information to the, to the WLL website, this time using a new version of the WLL website submission form. Unlike other times using the submission form above, I did not activate the, the Tor Anonymizer. Your Honor, this concludes my statement and facts for this uh, province inquiry. All right, looking at the time, uh my proposal from the way forward would be to uh, take the recess that we were discussing earlier, uh, go over the charge documents briefly, and then recess for lunch, and then begin the rest of the province inquiry. Uh, is that acceptable to both sides, or would you prefer something different? It's fine. Okay. This may United States ask for 10 minutes for that recess. All right. Court is in recess until 25 minutes after 12. All right.